Hello, and welcome once again to the Dental Marketing Mastery Series. This podcast is brought to you by dentalwebcontent.com and New Patients Incorporated. I'm Howie Horrocks, the founder of New Patients Incorporated. Along with me once again is my friend and partner and the president of New Patients Incorporated, Mark Dilatush. Well, welcome, listening audience. So this is Mark Dilatush uh, with the Dental Marketing Mastery Series podcasts. I um, want to remind everybody listening to our podcast that we have a, a sister Facebook group. It's a closed group by invitation only. You all are invited. It's called Dental Marketing Mastery Community. You search for it on Facebook and invite yourself and we will likely approve you and uh, you'll come in and follow up on their detailed conversations from these podcasts and from other things. So today we have a special guest. His name is Norman Gelfand and he comes to us uh, from a company called dentalrealestateexperts.com and he comes to us uh, partly by chance, partly by the collision of uh, multiple uh, business events. Uh, Norman works with an awful lot of dentists who are looking for new lease space, new real estate, or established practices. And we have a lot of those um, who are looking to expand, maybe expand into a larger space or expand into real real estate ownership. And I wanted to bring Norman into the mix with our podcasts because, I mean, we aren't real estate experts. We don't, you know, we don't have nearly the experience Norman has. Um, But Norman knows an awful lot about uh, the things to do and the things not to do. So Norm, welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're very welcome. So where are you physically located, Norman? We're in Austin, Texas. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, it's the Pearl of the South. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a bummer to drive around. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic in Austin is probably second to uh LA. But um but it's beautiful there. So so Norman <laughs> You and I, you and I have chatted back and forth about you know mutual clients and some things that that people just either they gloss over, or they don't pay attention to, um, and then some dentists will say, "Yeah, but I have an attorney," and then some dentists will say, "Is yeah, but I have you know someone helping me like a broker." So tell me, can you define those roles for the audience so that they have a clearer picture on who does what? And from what viewpoint? Well, typically, a broker will help you with location. And supposedly economics, the economic negotiation and the letter of intent. And that's where they usually stop. Then they'll say, well, here's the lease. Give it to your attorney and make sure it's okay. So what's wrong with all that? Well, what's wrong with all of that is that the lease is always shifted towards the landlord. It's a landlord's lease. And many of the attorneys know what's legal and enforceable because that's what they look for, legal and enforceable. But when it comes to the business part of the lease, some of them are clueless. And sometimes you find a good dental attorney that knows something about what's good business for a dentist and what's bad business for a dentist in the lease. Oh, okay. So, so really, I guess the middle ground would be someone who knows the, the legality and the enforceability, but someone who also knows the business of dentistry. Right. I could give you some great horror stories because of what uh, attorneys overlooked. Well, then let's, yeah, I mean, our audience loves a good horror story. <laughs> so... I mean, we share them all the time. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, give us a couple. Right. Of, give us a all couple right. of examples. I'll, give you, I'll give you a bunch of them because the horror stories is what we really protect against. Okay. So we're representing somebody that wants to buy a practice in Chicago. Now we're only looking at the lease that exists because anytime you buy a practice, you're buying into an existing lease. Of course. 
So in evaluating the lease for the buyer, I see that there's a recapture clause, is, which means in the event of a transfer or a sale, the landlord can take back the lease and negotiate directly with the new buyer of the practice. Ah. That's totally legal, but it's bad business. Right. The attorney would, in other words, the, it would, the attorney would just fly right by the attorney. Well, in this case, it did anyway. Right, right. And as a result, the seller had to drop his price $80,000 because the landlord raised the rent. Oh, so this is a big deal. He had that in his lease. So this is a big deal. Just this one little clause is a really a big deal for anyone who owns a practice in leased space. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, that, that's not a horror story. You just, you just saved or potentially helped thousands of dentists. That's not a horror story. That's, that's, you just told everybody what to look for. That's good. Well, yeah. uh, let's keep going for a couple of minutes and you're going to, you're going to see why the, the business portions of the lease is the most overlooked portion. Most of the dentists, of course, the location is critical and we help them find locations. Right. Economics. Sure, that's very important because that's the upfront money. The sure. Improvement allowances, uh, the free rent, all that sort of stuff. But what they miss is 61 vital points in a dental lease that can affect the value of their practice. I'll give you another example. It happened here in Austin. One of our clients is an endodontist. And he was in a shopping center that was re, uh, that was, foreclosed upon. Okay. Now, when a building is foreclosed upon, typically in most states, there may be an exception, but in, in most of the states that we've worked in, all the leases are void. There's no longer any leases. So now the landlord can negotiate with the tenant on a new lease, or if the landlord's going to repurpose the building, he may not want a dentist in there. So now the dentist is out and he's got no place to practice and he's got a huge loan, all because whoever did the lease did not put in uh, an agreement between the landlord, the lender, and the owner that they'd honor the lease in the event of a, of a foreclosure. So basically what you're yeah. saying is the owner, the landlord... If they want, let's say they had six tenants in one building mm -hmm. and they had an interested party wanted to come in and offer them double the rent mm -hmm. for all that space. Yeah. So the landlord says, you know what? I'm bankrupt. I'm going to claim bankruptcy. Void all those leases. And then just lease out to the new party that wanted the, the space more than the other six occupants. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm really saying is, and it, it, it happened right here, right. sometimes buildings go into foreclosure because the developer didn't have the right mix. He couldn't get the right tenants. Right. Reasons that buildings go into foreclosure. Sure. Now, in this case, this particular uh, shopping center had about six uh tenants in there, but it wasn't enough to carry the shopping center. Oh, 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 okay. So the guy was still underwater. Okay. He was underwater. Right. Because there was not the right agreement in the lease. Ah. Uh, right. Then a, a guy could lose his lease. The building repurposed for something else. Maybe they go on to make an office building, uh, an office thing out of the building. Right. No, maybe the, the uh, new owner had a son-in-law who was a dentist and would move into the space that he forced the existing tenant to vacate. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So we always protect against that eventuality. As a matter of fact, uh, my feeling is that unless you can get this kind of a clause of protection in the lease, you should walk the lease. Don't take it because it can affect the whole future. It can absolutely devastated dentist because no place to practice great big loan because right. they to build out the infrastructure and uh 
his credit shot because of the uh, money he owes. Yeah, no, and you know, not to mention loss of business in during the transition. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, okay, all right, that that was more like a horror story. Okay. okay well, how about another horror story? Oh, I got, okay. Go what horror stories? I got loads of horror stories. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> I've been doing this solely for dentists for 17 years. You're right. You hear some horror stories. You see them. No, I know. I know. And that, that's why, you know, um, Howie and I and all the advisors here, I don't know. I guess we're just we're like you we're just kind of protective right of our clients you know well, that's why they hire you that's why your clients you. exactly so you you, you kind of i guess you 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 just want to help you know just want to help them just want to protect them you know from doing so and that what well, you're what you do is not our expertise right so when when we run into um into folks like you who who have this you have this special skill this special niche to help protect our clients. It, that's why it's of interest to us. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead with your other horror okay. stories because I'm here's, sure here's a, yeah, people want this. People want to hear this. We did a deal in Charlotte. Yeah. So every lease says that the tenant cannot create a lien on the property. You can. Uh, he has to get rid of a lien. He cannot have a lien on the property because it clouds the title. So every lease will have that in it. Right. Now, call it a materials and uh, manufacturers lien. So now, in this case, we had a contractor that was building out for a new dentist. And the contractor's guys put the drywall in with all sorts of kicks in it. The, the drywall looked like, a, looked like the sea in a, in a storm. You know, you get it. Undulations throughout the drywall. Right. The uh, the contractor said, "Hey, that meets industry standards. You got to take it that way." And really, it was horrible. So, in most cases, without the proper protection, the tenant will have to pay the contractor. So there's no lien on the building, and then sue the contractor for the money that they had to give them for the bad work and have it done by somebody else. So they're paying twice for it. Sure. Right. Now, they, if, right. And, 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 and a lot of times that those lawsuits end up being un, unrecoverable to some contractors because they just go under, come up with a different name and they become somebody else overnight. That's very possible. And the fact is that an M and M lean can be protected in the contract. The ability to uh, bond around the lien is something you negotiate with the landlord. Okay. But every, every lease says you can't have any liens on the property. And you see, that's legal for the uh, lease to say that. Right. Uh, many that's, why, that's why an attorney wouldn't pick it up. Right. Right. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of like latent defects is a big thing. What's a latent defect? You go to, you go to lease some space. Dennis goes to lease some space and everything looks good. But there's mold behind the drywall because a Chinese restaurant is the adjacent tenant, let's say, or some kind of restaurant. Well, all leases that I have seen says you have to accept the space as is where it is, which means if there's mold behind the drywall, it's your problem. It's not the landlord's problem. See, that's, a, that's the shift of the risk. Right, right, right. The risk away from the tenant. Right. That's work on hard is to shift that risk. So if you have in a lease and it's, it's difficult to get, you really got to fight hard for your tenant for it. If you have in a lease protection against latent defects or concealed defects, what that really says is if there's a defect in the building that you could not determine by normal inspection methods, then 
that latent, that's a latent defect and that belongs to the landlord if you negotiate it properly in the contract. Right. Wow. This, um, yeah. And it, it sounds like in every case, an attorney would say, yep, that's legal and enforceable and just move on. They wouldn't say, well, that's not a good idea or a bad idea. That's what you guys do. You guys, exactly. look, you guys look at them and say, it's a good or bad for my client, not is it legal or not. Yeah. Well, I think we're one of the few uh, companies that really focus on protecting the tenant by shifting risk away from the tenant towards uh, others. Uh, right. It takes a lot of time to negotiate that, but we feel it's a good investment in uh, client relations to do all of that. Now, so, so how, do, how does your firm, how does it, well, first of all, how does a dentist reach out to you, Norman? Well, they can uh, send us an email. They can give me a call. They can, uh, take a look at our website and click on something on our website that'll send us an email. Okay. So, all right. So there, for the folks listening to this dental real estate experts.com is the name of the, uh, the name of the website. And Norman, why don't you tell everybody your email address? It's N Gelfand. It's a little more difficult than dental real estate experts. It's N Gelfand. G E L F Foxtrot A N D Dental R X P dot com. Dental R X P dot com. Okay, cool. Right. All right, wonderful. And your phone number there? It's 512-833-5300. All right. So they call you. So uh, so whether it's a startup or a dentist that's maybe looking to renegotiate a lease or maybe looking for new space or what have you, whatever the situation is, they call you, they tell you their situation. And then how do you contract with them and how do you get paid? Well, we are paid by the landlord's broker splitting his fee. A landlord, uh, points uh, a marketing broker and pays him a percentage of the lease. Right. Okay. If, there, if the tenant does not have representation, that listing broker keeps the entire uh, fee. Right. If the, if the tenant has representation, which by law he's allowed to, then that listing broker splits his fee. And we enter into an agreement with our client that our fiduciary responsibility is to our client. Even though we're being paid through the landlord's broker, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the client and we could lose our license if we did uh, do everything we could for the client's benefit. Right, right. So it's, it's very much, so it's not like the dentist has to take money out of their pocket. Not at all. And economically, historically, we usually save the tenant somewhere between eight and 10% of the uh, advertised price. And we don't charge uh, for, for that saving. That's, okay. We know that it's inflated some. Right. Okay. Land. So we feel that that's part of our job is to get the best price that we can for the tenant. Um, what's the most popular dental business life cycle where you see the most clients? Is it the startup, the young dentist? Is it the, uh, you know, mid thirties, early forties dentist looking for their first location? There's two. Okay. The young dentist that's starting out. Okay. The second one is the dentist that's about 50 years old and sell his practice in 10 years. Ah, Okay. And if, you, if you've been in a space for 20 years, like a lot of dentists have, the demographics can change. The uh, physical layout can be obsolete. Sure. And functional obsolescence, economic obsolescence, all types of So what they do is they look for a spot that's within a mile and a half or two miles of where their existing place was. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, excellent demographics and so forth. They'll even grow their practice from there with a view towards selling it when they're ready to retire. Okay. All right. 
So it doesn't, so it's, this isn't really necessarily for a startup. This is for almost anybody. Oh yeah. And in fact, yeah. if you're buying a practice, you want to evaluate the existing lease and many times renegotiate it. Oh, there you go. Right. Right. So that's, that becomes part of the, actual, <coughs> excuse me, that becomes part of the transaction, that negotiation. It should be. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, Norman, I thank you. I think our listeners thank you. I think, I know I just learned a few things. Um, boy, I'm real sure a lot of our listeners just, I bet you some of them are scrambling to go find their lease right now, right? Well, if, the, if, if someone has a question on their lease, they can send that lease to me and I'll take a look at it. We don't charge uh, to take a look at something if it's just a matter of some counsel. Oh, yeah, it's the same with us. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't, we never charge for a phone call. Well, Norman, thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, don't be surprised if I bring you back because I think that we get feedback on these podcasts. People can ask us questions in the, in the Facebook forum and they often do, you know, and, and uh, um, I don't be surprised if I ask you to come back on here and, and maybe uh, we'll go a little deeper into some more horror stories. That sounds like fun. Maybe around Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll do it then. Sure, I'm happy to be on your program anytime that's good for you. Oh, thanks Norman. Have a great one. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed our podcast today. You can find more podcasts on our YouTube channel, on Stitcher, and iTunes. Also on our websites, dentalwebcontent.com and newpatientsinc.com.